Hey guys, welcome back. So today, working on this 5500 watt Predator generator. And as you can tell by looking at it, it's in very good shape. It's about 10 years old, still has the new generator tag on it. And I'm told it has about six hours of runtime on it. Anyway, the prior owner had issues with it. He tried pulling the engine over recently. It was very hard to turn over and he assumed it had a bad compression release. Uh, just to be sure, he double checked the valve clearance because excessive clearance on the exhaust can emulate a bad ACR and he found no issues with the clearance. So he called Harbor Freight, tried to order a new camshaft and came up empty. Harbor Freight told him it was no longer available. So at that point he put it up for sale and luckily Kenny from Ken Small Engine found this machine and picked it up for only $130. And he bought it with the intention of passing it on to me. So thank you, Ken, for that. Anyway, we got a big clue this morning. He's had it for a few days and he went to pull it over and the engine was stuck. It would not rotate. It was locked solid. And unknown to me, when I went to go pick it up a few hours later, the first thing I did was pull the engine over and the engine did rotate. I got it about half a turn and he had a look of amazement on his face and then he told me what happened. So I stopped pulling the engine over and that is a big clue. That is actually a good sign because what I'm thinking is that we have a bad needle in seat. The fuel was left on and if given enough time, fuel will leak past the needle and seat. It'll fill up the cylinder and hydrolock the engine and eventually make its way past the rings. And the crankcase can actually fill with fuel. So I think I'm going to start there. Let me get you set up a little bit better. I want to get the fill cap off the engine block. And if everything's normal, nothing should happen. But if fuel filled that engine, we might get a flood of oil and fuel. All right, let's see what we have here. Got the cardboard laid out just in case there's a flood. And there's not. I was kind of hoping for a flood. So if the needle and seat are not working, not much has made it past the piston and rings. So let's pull the spark plug out and pull the engine over and just make sure there is nothing in the cylinder. Ken's favorite. It's a torch plug. Looks really clean. It does look a little wet. So yeah, maybe there is something in there. Anyway, the ignition is turned off. I'm going to get this spark plug boot as far out of the way as possible, just in case we get fuel coming out. I don't want the spark to have any chance of igniting it. Definitely not hydrolocked. The oil was fine. Nothing came out of the cylinder. So if the engine locked up like the way he said, I'm thinking the compression release is broken. The compression is just really that high. So let's get the compression tester on there and just see how high it is. With a properly functioning compression release, the compression should be around 60 PSI. You know, sometimes it's a little lower or a little higher but 60 is usually what I see. Let's see what this one comes in at. <laughs> it's 
Yeah, it's hard. I can see why he thought it was stuck. We're already at, I'd say 100, 110. And I only got one good pull. So let me reset it. Let's try it one more time. A lot of compression. We're at, I'd say 130 PSI. So yeah, compression release is not working. I guess the question is, are the valves misadjusted or is it actually broken? So let's get the valve cover off and take a look at that clearance. Gonna rotate the engine until the intake valve is open and we'll double check the clearance on that exhaust. Feels fine. If anything, I'd say it's a little tight. So I think he was right. The compression release, I would say is broken. I'm gonna keep rotating the engine when we get to the compression stroke. If it's working, we should see that exhaust valve bump a little, but I'm not expecting to see anything. Both valves are closed. We're starting the compression stroke. And now the exhaust valve is opening. I did not see any exhaust valve bump. Let's just do it one more time. Both valves are closed. Yeah, nothing. I did not feel the tap it pushing the push rod. So either it's broken or maybe it's stuck. I think I'm gonna get the oil out and we can use the boroscope, take a peek, see if there's any parts floating around inside that engine. It's tight. The oil looks to be pretty clean. Not seeing any metallic, no chunks, no signs of an issue really. So I guess that is a good sign. Means the engine is in pretty good health besides the compression release. I'm gonna use this boroscope to take a look inside and I am recording the video so I can put it up on screen. So that is the sump. And I don't see any big chunks. On the bottom left, I do see a little some little specks that look a little suspicious. Let's see if I can look up. I'm gonna to switch to the side cam. So 
So here's a pretty good view of the camshaft. The top left, you can see the lobe where a drop of oil just came off of. And above that is the tappet. And if you look down, following down the camshaft toward the gear, between the gear and the lobe are a bunch of linkages. You know, I see a spring. I see the actual compression release mechanism more or less in its entirety. But it looks like it's not in the right spot. So let me show you. I actually have a camshaft from a Predator, which I'm hoping will fit in this engine. But let me pull that out and just show you what I'm seeing right now with this boroscope versus what it should be. So this is my extra camshaft. It actually came from a Predator, the 420cc engine, which is what this has. So my hope is I can use this camshaft in place of the one that's in there. This one really was the only piece that survived from two blown up predators I did a video on last year. And thankfully, the compression release is intact. The way this works is that on the exhaust lobe, there's this extra little piece right there that moves out of the way due to centrifugal force when, the, when this gear is spinning. And when you shut the engine down, this spring pulls everything back in place. So when you pull the engine over at low speed, that gives the exhaust valve an extra little bump when normally there shouldn't be, and that lets compression out, making it easier to turn the engine over. So what I saw through the boroscope was that this piece here, which should be where this one is right now, it was actually more like that. So definitely stuck, not all the way, like this is fully off, that's fully on. It was somewhere, you know, in between. So why is it hanging up? I'm not sure. I did see the spring, that's what pulls it back, so that is not the issue. I can only assume either it's gummed up or there is some actual physical damage on it. You know, either way, I think the engine does need to be opened up. So let's get the power head uninstalled. We'll strip down the frame, obviously get the engine off the frame, and we'll open it up, get the camshaft out, and see what the issue is. Well, that did not go as planned. There's about $20 of fuel in that tank, and I was just gonna drain it out and throw it right in the car, but it kind of backfired. I went to remove the fuel line, and with almost no force, it broke the petcock. So that is no good. You know, draining it from here is gonna be a messy operation at this point. So I do have a fuel pump, so I'm gonna use that instead. We'll just get the tank drained and get the tank out of the way. So you can't open up the engine with the generator attached. And you can't remove the generator with the exhaust attached because it's attached to the generator. 
And you can't remove the exhaust without removing this tin right here to gain access to those bolts. So I say we start with this tin, get the exhaust off, the power head off, and then we should be free to get that engine out of there. This has got to be one of the cleanest generators I've ever taken apart. So whoever owned it before clearly took care of it. Just got unlucky. That bolt is surprisingly tight. go. Looks absolutely brand new in here. Anyway, we need to disconnect all this to free up the stator and make room for the puller. So just take note, especially these wires, where they all go. Take pictures, take video. They have to go back in the right place. And even the wires on the brushes, the red wire always goes on the left. This one's pretty easy. We have two red wires, two black wires. That's most likely leg one, leg two, and two sets of white wires, which are the neutral. So technically, the white wires don't have to go back in exactly the right spot, meaning this wire could probably go to there instead of there. But I'm going to mark them anyway and put them back exactly where they were.
we are pretty much ready to get the power head off. All the wiring has been disconnected. The wires coming out of the stator can stay. I needed to get everything off though to free up some space to get a puller to get this ball bearing out. So that we'll do in a minute. You do want to be careful when doing that. We need to get the stator bolts out first. And even before then, we need to get some wood under here to support the engine because once the stator comes off, these supports are gone and everything is going to want to crash down to the ground. So let's get some wood in there. We'll raise it up a bit so it clears these bolts and then we'll get that stator out. I'm actually gonna pull these mounts all together because I can't lift the stator up much higher. It hits the control panel. It will not clear this and that's just gonna fight me when getting that stator off. Be very careful with the puller. These end housings, they break really easy. I've broken my fair share. Do not put a puller arm in there. There's not a lot to it because it's cut out for the brushes, uh, but it is fairly safe to use it on the other side. So this generator is in pretty good shape. There's not a lot of corrosion. I'm expecting this to come off without too much of a fight. Yeah, I don't even need a wrench. Wish they were all this easy. And last but not least, we have the rotor. So there's a few ways to get this off without causing damage. My preferred way is with water, and I've got a few videos on that, so I'll link to that if you're interested in that. And most likely that's what I'm gonna do here. The other way would be just loosening this bolt a little bit, maybe get about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch out, and then hit the bolt a few times, and the shock a lot of times we'll pop the rotor off as well, especially on something like this where there's not a lot of rust. So I might give that a go. The only catch is you can definitely bend or damage the bolt. And of course, if you miss and you hit the rotor, then the rotor is trash. There is a lot of risk to that. And the other method is using a rod to push it off the tapered shaft. In this case, it won't work because the bolt that goes through here, it's the same size as the bore. And if you put a rod in there that's the same size as the bolt and the threads, you're going to push right into the threads on the crankshaft and then you're going to destroy it. So that is not an option here. So let's loosen that bolt, tap it a few times. I'm not going to push my luck. If that doesn't work, we'll try some water.
Yep, not going to push my luck. The Honda clones, they are already threaded for an M12 1.75. So the idea is just to fill the shaft here with water. You can use any liquid. A lot of manuals say to use oil. I like prefer water though, because it's very easy to clean up. And now we're topped off. So with the M12 1.75 bolt, you just put a bunch of Teflon on it. You want to make a watertight seal and then crank it down. In this case, I already put the bolt in just to see how deep the threads go. And we can go pretty deep right about to there before we bottom out. So this should be fairly easy to build some pressure, assuming I get enough Teflon on there. So let's get some Teflon on, crank it down, and that rotor should pop right out of there. Use plenty of Teflon. That's always my mistake. I never use enough the first time. So maybe I'll get it right this time. And I'm only going to bring the Teflon up as far as I can crank down the bolt. Just use that as a guide. Because if you over torque it, you can strip out the threads. Then you're in trouble. You can tell pretty quickly if it's gonna work, just tightening it by hand. If it starts to get difficult, then you know you're building pressure. In this case, I do see water coming out. Yeah, so I need more Teflon. That might work. There we go. That's pretty much it. We only have two more bolts holding that engine to the frame and it should come right out and then we can open it up. I have all the parts laid out here, the tanks over on the other side, but yeah, overall, it's a fairly easy process. It can be intimidating, especially with all the wiring and the power head. That by far is the most difficult part. The ball bearings can stick and lead to a broken end housing and the rotor can be a real challenge at times. What I did earlier, striking that bolt with the hammer, that was a little careless. And if it doesn't work within a few hits, that's it. Stop, try another method, because it can escalate quickly and you can damage the power head. And then the repair you're trying to do is more or less worthless. Anyway, let's get the engine out of the frame. We'll stand it up, open up the crankcase and pull out that camshaft.
Just gonna line up the timing marks before pulling the cam out. And interestingly enough, the dot does not line up with the timing mark, but this hole does. And there it is. It is stuck on. Actually, looks like it's stuck all the way on. Don't see anything obviously broken. Now, the design of this does look a little different than the cam I was showing you earlier, so maybe it's not compatible. And now it's where it should be. So let's just try it a few times. And it seems to work just fine. Interesting. So, yeah, that's all it was. It's now fixed. Not sure why it got stuck. But I can't reproduce it. Interesting. So should I put this one back in? Or should I use the other? Let me grab the other, see how similar they are. Just holding both cams so the timing mark is facing up. And I want to make sure the lobes are in the same orientation and looks like they are. Compression release mechanisms are different. I already checked the total length. They are the same. This, the other thing we can check real quick is the journal size. So 0 0.62, 0 0 0.62, 0 0.62. So they do seem to be compatible. I guess we can check the lobes real quick. So this lobe, I believe, is the intake lobe. We're at 1.29. Exhaust is 1.25. 1.29. And 1.25. So yeah, these cams, I would say they are interchangeable. You know, I guess the question is, do I put the one back in that was stuck? That seems to be fine now. Or do I put the one in that has never been stuck but came from a blown up engine? Personally, I think I trust this one better. It has survived a trauma and kept on going. So let's use this one. Actually, let me clean it up a little bit and then I'll put it in. I guess while we're here, we'll talk about the governor real quick, just show you how it works. There's really not much to it. There's a spring on the outside holding the throttle plate open at a fixed spring tension. And then we have the governor in here, which applies force via these weights. So this gear meshes with these, and it's really based on engine speed. The faster the engine spins, the more force on these weights pushing this little piece of metal in the center up. And that piece of metal makes contact with this arm right here. You can actually see the little dot right there. That's where the governor is riding. And the faster the engine spins, the harder it'll push this down, which is gonna slow the engine down. And when the engine does slow down, this force is reduced and the spring pulls it back open the throttle until an equilibrium is reached. So yeah, it's a pretty simple system really. And it's amazing with such a small amount of travel that it's able to control the engine speed as it does. Anyway, let's get this off. And I'll just clean this up a little more, degrease it, do the same to the cover, and I have a new gasket 
We'll just get that in place and put it all back together. This camshaft, it's been thoroughly degreased, all the dirt cleaned off, and I'm just adding some assembly lube back to it so it doesn't start dry. Anyway, I have a theory on what happened with the other camshaft, and it has to do with the bits of metal we saw through the boroscope. I did just clean everything out, and there was some metal bits, just little pieces, and I'm wondering if maybe a little bit just didn't happen to go in the right spot on that other camshaft, and that's why it hung up. You know, I'm not really sure, but that would be my best guess. Picked up this gasket kit from Amazon. It was pretty cheap. I think it was around $12 and it is a complete kit. Obviously, I don't need this all for this project, so the, a lot of these will be used in the future. I'm just after the one right there. I don't have a service manual for this engine. It is just a clone though of a Honda GX390 and that I do have specs on. According to Honda, this cover should be torqued to 24 Newton meters, which is 212 inch pounds. And I also have a manual for a Rato 420cc Honda clone. And that manual calls for 28 Newton meters. That's closer to 250 inch pounds. You know, in this case, I'm gonna go more conservative We'll bring it up to 212, first going to 100, and then to the 212. Got the engine rotated to top dead center, and both valves have a little clearance. I do need to double check that, but for now, I'm just gonna rotate the engine over, paying attention to the exhaust valve. I wanna see that there's a little bump during that compression stroke. As the exhaust stroke, the exhaust valve is open. Now the intake should open. Now we're starting the compression stroke. So if I keep going, we should see this bump a little bit, which means the compression release is working. And it did, it just bumped. Good. So that is sorted out. Let's just double check these. Someone's definitely been in here. This flat spot should be facing down. Otherwise, when the rocker pushes the valve, 
it's going to make contact with the side of the retainer and eventually it's going to break that retainer and cause the valve to fall on the engine. So the exhaust looks okay, but the intake does need to be fixed. So I'm going to completely remove the rocker. We'll just rotate that retainer around and then we'll set the valves. So the key here is to not release the valve while rotating the retainer down because if you release it, the valve will fall on the engine. So that is a, a risk, but I have no choice. If I don't rotate this down, this retainer will eventually fail and destroy the engine. Should be good. The manual does not say anything about valve clearance on this engine. Usually the intake is between four and six thousand, so I'm going to set it right at five. Bit of drag at five thousandths and a lot of drag at six. So I think that'll be okay. The exhaust I'm aiming for seven thousandths, which fits quite loose right now. That feels pretty good. Before I go any further, let's check the compression real quick. Hopefully we're somewhere close to 60 PSI. We are right at 60. Perfect. Makes me nervous having an engine without oil in it. So let's fill it up. I didn't show this earlier, but I'll show it now. In order to get the engine out, I had to disconnect these wires coming from the control panel. 
And to reconnect them, thankfully everything is, is color coded. So we'll start with this red wire that comes from the oil module. That supplies a ground for the low oil light on the control panel. Now we have the black wire from the low oil module. That's what grounds out and kills spark. So we need to connect that to the ignition coil right there. We also have two more plugs feeding the ignition coil. One of them, actually both of them come from the control panel. One of them is the ignition switch. So when you shut the switch off, it kills the spark. And the other one actually gets power from the ignition coil. Every time that magnet passes, it generates voltage in the primary. And that is how the low oil light lights up. It gets power from the primary and it's grounded out. And the only ones we have left are the fuel solenoid. So we get those connected. And that should be it. Just getting off the starter recoil. I'm gonna put a wrench on it, hold the crankshaft still while I tighten down that rotor. This rotor bolt, it's 10 millimeters in diameter and they get torqued to 29 foot pounds. Just make sure you know which bolt you have because they also come in eight millimeters and those take a lot less torque. I think 20 foot pounds at most and even that's pushing it. The stator bolts, they get torqued anywhere between 80 and 120 inch pounds. I usually go on the light side about 90. Got the starter recoil back on because I want to pull the engine over. The spark plug's still out. There should be no compression. I want to spin it, make absolutely sure that the rotor is not making any contact with that stator. Also, just a side note, I forgot to install this grounding strap, so that has been fixed. 
And also, that piece of wood I should have taken out before tightening these mounts. Anyway, let's spin the engine over. Perfect. I think it's safe to get everything wired up back to the way it was.
try this out real quick. I'm just filling the bowl with some fuel. We'll start it. It won't run for too long, but it will run long enough to know if we're in good shape. And it's taking a lot of fuel, so I think we're going to be flooding in a second. Yep. We sure are. Hmm. I think that carp has to come off. It always comes down to the carb. And you would think with a broken compression release that the carb would be fine. But something happened and it's not even trying to stop the fuel. Bowl nuts nice and clean. Carburetor looks spotless. Needle does not seem to be moving. Let me blow through it real quick. Yeah, it seems to be fine now. The first time I did it, it was leaking a little air, and now it's seating nicely. So it was most likely because I had it tipped up on its side, and that needle alignment just went off. But let's just take it out anyway, make sure there's not something stuck in the seat. Yeah, looks fine. So I say we put it back together. We'll try it again. Looks like we're good. Fuel line is right about there and it's holding steady. So I'm gonna to torque this down. We'll leave the air box off for now and we'll try starting it in a minute once all this fuel dries up. Things are looking pretty good. The engine, it was easy to pull over, it started right up, and we're making power. So I think we're out of the woods on this one. We just need to finish it up. So I'm gonna get the air box back on, the tank back on, and I wanna get this outside for a load test. Back here again, the carb, it started leaking severely like it did last time. So I took it apart again, and this time I blew some air right through this little hole where the fuel comes into the carburetor and a little tiny shard of metal came out. So that is what was hanging up the needle. I think it is from the broken fuel petcock pipe that sent a piece down the fuel line. Anyway, I already unscrewed the bad one, put a new one in. We should be good to go. Just a quick little tip here. The Predator generators, they usually don't come with a wheel kit that is an optional feature. Instead, there is a rubber foot mounted to the bottom of each corner of the generator. And since this has a wheel kit, it doesn't need those rubber feet anymore. They come in really handy on other machines. So I usually go around to each corner and steal the extra rubber feet hiding beneath the rail. And there it is.
I've worked on a few predators that I just could not get them to start. The carbs were clean, no issue found, and it would not start. And what I found was that this sticker was on upside down. At least that's my guess, because looking at this sticker, it looks like it's saying to the right is choke. And that is not the case, because if you look at this carb here, to the right, the choke is open. To the left, it's closed. So that sticker is upside down. So I'm going to try to flip it around. Worst case, it needs to come off. All right, let's give this a try. I've got a bunch of stuff connected in, ready to go. And the plan is to just get the engine started. We'll get it up to temp. We'll take a look at the voltage, the hertz. We'll use the amp probe to check the harmonic distortion and the oscilloscope to see the sine wave. So once it's running, we'll check that stuff without a load. We'll put 3000 watts on, check the output again, and then finally bring it up to 5000 watts and see how it does. I've also got the sound meter set up. It's about 25 feet away. And without me speaking, we're at about 46 decibels. Now, this generator seemed a little louder than most, so I'm curious to see where it comes in at.
Well, I'm happy to report it started second pull and everything came online without issue. We started at 60 and a half hertz, 121 volts, and about four and a half percent total harmonic distortion. The sound level though, that was quite high considering there was no load. We started close to 83 decibels with no load and under 5,000 watts, that only increased to about 85%. I think that was the max I saw. The voltage actually came up under that load to 123 volts and the engine held just fine at 59 hertz. Now, the distortion, it jumped quite a bit. I think once I put 3,000 watts on, it jumped up close to 15%, and then under 5,000 watts, closer to 18% distortion. And that that is high. It is typical, though, for a brushed generator with an AVR under that kind of a load to have that much distortion. So this is running, I would say, exactly as it should. I don't see any issues here. Now, out of curiosity, though, I did go to the Harbor Freight site and take a look at how they advertise this generator at as far as the decibels go and they say it's a 73 decibel machine now they didn't say at what load or at what distance you know i didn't see anything close to that i guess the one thing worthy of note though is that their current 5500 watt model has a 301 cc engine which is a 10 horse engine and that's the minimum you need to pull 5500 watts this one has a 420 cc engine, which is better for about 14 horsepower. So there's plenty of power to spare. That might explain some of the noise and I'm assuming it's not gonna be as efficient. Anyway, you know, this one was an easy fix. It wasn't even broken. It was just a stuck compression release. And most likely I could have put that camshaft back in and not had an issue. But since I had an extra one, that I knew was good, I thought that would be the safer bet. Anyway, I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching. Go kart time? Yes! <laughs> no, 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 not that one. Yeah, this is the type of switch that I like. Yes. All right, choke. Ready? I think so. Try not to run over the kilowatt. Okay. <laughs>